hello, Dr. Chetan Nayak. Uh, we're very glad to have you here at the Quantum Matter International Conference. I know that you had a, a very uh, crowded talk this morning and that you're having fun around, so. Thank you, it's a good pleasure to be here. It's a great conference and I enjoyed the questions in my talk. It was a good audience. Great to hear that. Okay, we have a few questions for you sure. and for audience that was not able to, to attend the meeting. First, can you please tell us a little bit about quantum, uh, topological quantum computing. What is it in, in easy words? Uh, yeah. Why is it important for quantum computing? Yeah. So topological quantum computing is based on the idea that the type of qubits we would make would be built on a topological state of matter. So we would encode quantum information in topological degrees of freedom of certain states of matter so that it would be relatively insensitive to noise and other perturbations. So it's, a, it's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an answer to the question, how do we get better qubits? Mm -hmm. And by better, we mean qubits that are more stable because you know, right now, the best qubits are very close to the error correction threshold, close to or at or maybe slightly below, at least for some error rates. So they're sitting at around 99%, 99.9% fidelities. You know, it's very hard to build a quantum computer with those fidelities. You really want to have extra margin, you know, an extra nine or even two nines if possible. Because otherwise, you'll either barely be scraping by or you will spend spending the vast majority of your time and the vast majority of your qubits just on error correction. So you really want to have something that is significantly more stable. And you want to do it without giving up a small full footprint or without having gate speeds that are gate times that are very long. So it's an approach to try to get better qubits, which is something that we all want. And right? we used to hear about ones and zeros. That's a completely different. Eh? It's a completely different approach. As an expert in, in the quantum, a pioneer in the quantum field, uh, how do you envision uh, this new technology having an impact in our everyday life in a few years? Yeah. Let's say 10, because it's not going to solve everything. It's not going to solve everything, correct. So, you know, in the, in the hype that you hear about quantum computing, you hear things like, oh, quantum computers are going to cure cancer, predict the stock market, all kinds of things. Climate and the change, is, everything. Yeah, everything. <laughs> but, the, but, you know, the, the truth is quantum computers, especially on the timescales you're talking about, early quantum computers, the first useful, really useful quantum computers will have maybe a thousand logical qubits which might be a million physical qubits, but a thousand logical qubits. With that, you can solve very important quantum chemistry problems. You can solve very important material science problems. Actually, you mentioned climate change. If you want to develop a catalyst for carbon capture, those molecules or a catalyst for nitrogen fixation, that's, you know, nitrogen fixation is done primarily with the Haber process to make fertilizers. It's actually a non-trivial fraction of the world's energy is spent on making fertilizer, naturally, because that's what you need to feed the planet. If we had, better, if we had better, better catalysts, we could do that better. And that's a very hard thing to do by trial and error, just experimentation. It's also, those molecules are too big to simulate with today's, with classical computers. And it, because, they have, because those catalysts typically are transition metals, you won't get the accuracy classically. So you really need a quantum computer, and it's only a few thousand logical qubits is what you need. But quantum computers, what they won't be good for, so that's what they will be good for. What they won't be good for is big data problems. Because with a few thousand logical qubits, you can't put that much classical information, right? So you can't load up huge data sets. And in any case, quantum computers, their individual gate speeds and the speed of loading data into them is going to be really slow. So you don't want to use them on big data problems. You want small data problems, but with big compute. And it needs to be something with super polynomial speed up. There's always a but, but still it, yeah. it sounds really, really exciting. Uh, but which are the main challenges to make it real? or the, the, the challenges you're facing. Yeah, yeah. so I, look, I, th I think there's two basic challenges. You know, one is on the qubit side, okay, which is we need better qubits. And I'm not the only person who's saying this. Many people in the field are saying this. We need better qubits. That's why we're excited about the topological approach because it is a, an approach to getting qubits that are more stable and have a small footprint and get fast gate speeds, okay? The other problem is that's on the qubit side. On the system side, there's a big input-output bottleneck. Because qubits, or quantum processors, unlike classical processors, there's no fan out. So you need at least one control line, and usually a few, maybe order one control lines per qubit. Not like a transistor, which may have billions or even hundreds of billions of transistors on a classical CPU, but it's thousands of control lines, you know? Because of fan out, you don't have that in a quantum computer. So you need some strategy, particularly your quantum computer is probably cryogenic, it's sitting in the fridge. How do you get that much, you know, control? Control, having that many control lines and potentially readout lines as well into a quantum computer. Cool. 
Um, and there is really a race, a friendly competition, you say, yeah. among big yeah. corporations that are trying to, to, to make their best to produce the first quantum computers. Um, what do you think that Microsoft has to offer that is different? What, what's your approach that makes uh, a difference from Microsoft? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we, at Microsoft, we've been really focused on the applications that I mentioned. You know, so we've start, been thinking a lot about what do you need to make a computer that can solve these kind of quantum chemistry problems? And in thinking about that, we've, we've been working on those problems in formulating them so that you can use them with a quantum computer by going as far as you can with classical compute and machine learning to, to you know, speed up those kinds of calculations classically so that you can then use the quantum processor as a coprocessor, not for acceleration, but actually for improving the accuracy of those calculations. That's what you really need the quantum mechanics for there. So that's on the one hand. And then once you think of that target application, or target application in mind, you think, well, I'm going to need millions of physical qubits. And they, that's assuming we have very low error rates, small foot, and you'll need small footprint and fast gate times, because you want to solve these problems in a month, not in a century. So that led us to thinking about, first of all, about topological qubits. It led us to think about cryo-CMOS for control. So I think what's unique is you know, we, we are you know, really trying to make a whole new type of qubit and, you know, and, a, and a very different kind of control system. Keep up the good work because we look forward to seeing yeah. them <laughs> working as soon as possible. Um, you have spent a significant part of your life in the academia and now you're leading a team in a big corporation. Uh, it gives you a privileged view, overview of the, of the whole process and the whole environment. You know? Is it complementary? What did you learn from the two worlds? Yeah, you know, look, uh, yes. So I think the, that um, the, the, the style of work in academia has a role and is very good for some things, and the style of work in a company is very different and very good for... If you want to explore a large face space, the way it's done in academia is perfect because there's many different projects. People follow curiosity, and in some sense, you almost do a random walk, and you can try many, many things out. But if you're trying to get to a set destination and you want to find the most deterministic path to that destination, well, that random walk of you know, an academic group, theory, experiment combined, maybe working on 10 different projects, slightly random, all at small scale, and that's a great way to cover face space. You find something interesting, then you know, people pour on it. But if you're trying to follow a determ more deterministic trajectory, then having the focus, having an idea of like, no, we're gonna focus everything on this approach, will fail fast and then correct or will succeed okay. is something that companies do well, especially startups. Yeah. Okay. You know, because you startups have to, because in many ways, all of us, even at, big, at the big corporations that are doing quantum computing, we're like a startup inside of a big company. Yeah. You know, and we, we have that mindset and that focus that, okay, we've got to try to deliver something. And you work together with other startups, this, this flourishing environment? No, I mean, because a lot of the technology is proprietary, so, you know, we, 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 we are, it's friendly competition between us and other companies and startups. We, we work with other companies who are not our competitors, you know, to, to, for, for specific things. We might buy components or something like that. Okay, understood. Yep. Uh, now let's get a, a little personal, because I've seen in your LinkedIn profile highlights uh, about your commitment to respect, success, and curiosity. Yeah. How, does this, how do you apply these values to your everyday life, and how does it... Uh, make uh, a difference in the research you're doing? Well, you know, fundamentally, um, especially in a team that's trying to you know, work together, as I said, you know, not, not sort of scattered and everyone doing their own thing, but if you're really trying to work together as a team, it's absolutely essential to, to, you know, for, for everyone in that team to respect each other because you're dependent on the next person. You don't take something to completion by yourself. You're dependent on someone handing you something. You do your piece and you hand it to the next person. So you have to have complete trust that what you're getting is real and that the person after you has to have, have that trust. So in a situation like this, where no one person owns a very large part of a project, you have to have that teamwork and trust and respect. So teams are, are important. In fact, uh, I've read you said that uh, you look for an eclectic team to face the insolvable. Yeah. No? Uh, what are you looking for uh, when you look for someone to join your team? What are the key aspects that you look for in someone to, to work uh, with? Someone who's intellectually nimble and adaptable, that can learn new things, can change their way of thinking, that uh, can, can recognize a problem and go after it and not just be kind of set with something. And, and part of the reason for that is, you know, if you ask what were the big problems of quantum computing. And I said, well, the things I mentioned are two different things. One was very much about the qubit side. 
you know, how do you make better qubits, which is really, in many ways, is very deep physics, right? Deep physics and material science. And the second one I said is, oh, we have an input-output bottleneck. There's no, there's no fan out. So we need some control strategy and readout strategy that scales. That's actually you know, much closer to classical systems engineering and electrical engineering, signal processing. So those are two very different types of problems. But you can't actually solve either one of those problems in vacuum. It's not actually two disjoint problems because your solution to those two problems has to be compatible. So in fact, there's different skill sets, and the skill sets, that pe there have to be overlap. You know, we have people fabricating devices. They aren't necessarily experts in topological phase or quantum physics, but the people who are experts in topological phases may not be experts in some aspects of the fabrication. We have electrical engineers doing electronics or, um, you know, RF design for us. And, you know, all, all these people from these different backgrounds, many different nationalities as well, but all these people with these different backgrounds and different skill sets, need to be able to work well together. So it, th there, there are those translation steps that, that, that are so essential for success in a project like this. And so we need people who, yes, have you know, expertise, you know, are subject experts and mastery of a particular thing, but actually have some understanding of the nearby fields so that they can work effectively together. That sounds uh, great, uh, a broad uh, fields of, of knowledge that you have in your team and, and very inspiring. So if you need a communicator, I might send you my curriculum. <laughs> but by now, let's keep enjoying yeah. this beautiful event. Thank you very much for your, for your time and, and your thoughts. Yeah. And for you, please stay tuned for more videos and enjoy the Quantum Matter International Conference 2023. Thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you.